Thank you so much, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kimler. She is one of my favorite actresses working with incredible performances in films like Another Year, All or Nothing, Phantom Thread, Maleficent, and now you can see another perfect turn by Leslie Manfield in the second season of Mum. Let's take a look at a clip. Should we put it in the kitchen? I don't on the whole street knowing how old I am. <laughs> didn't need to bring any cake. I've made one. Yes, I thought you might. My presents in the bag. Which bag, no? The yellow one. So what age is it when you get the old lady smell? Morning. Okay. I cut my toenails this morning. Got a lot more room in my socks. Everybody, the great Leslie Manville. Hey, thanks so much for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, congratulations on season two. Thank you. Um, I, so, you know, I guess there's a lot of comedy in the Mike Lee films, I think, in some of them that you do as well. Mm. Um, but this is, for the most part, kind of a straight comedy show, right? Well, I, I There's don't a little know. drama. I, I, yeah, I'd say it's... Grounded comedy. It's, yeah, good, you've said it all. It's grounded <laughs> comedy, so it's, yeah. Or, or, I don't know if you call it here, we, we say um, dramedy. Mm -hmm. Do you use that phrase? Yeah, we have that, yeah. Um, or drama, anyway, maybe I've got that completely wrong, but yeah, it's, 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 the thing is, it's very, I think it, it's, it's, it's not unlikely that you'd link it to the Mike Lee stuff because it's, it's, uh, it's less a kind of boom boom, here's the joke kind of comedy show. It's, it's funny because the characters are funny and the situations they're put in, which are quite normal everyday situations, but it, it, it highlights the sort of detail and the minutiae of, um, sometimes the ridiculousness of life or the awkwardness of life. And um, it, it's funny because the characters are funny. And, and you see the world of mum through uh, the mum, which is mum. Kathy, who I play. Uh, you see it through her eyes and it's as if she's the audience. So that if the audience are thinking, oh, that person's ridiculous or they've just said something insensitive, it's shot so that, in a way, the audience are thinking what Kathy's thinking. She's kind of the straight man to the whole, to the yeah, whole oh, show. Oh, definitely. I mean, I've had to do more crying than um, deliver jokes in Mum. I mean, it, it, it series two, season two, as you say here, season two especially is um, is really very emotional as the relationship between her and Peter Mullen's character sort of develops into a sort of will they, won't they, are they going to this sort of midlife, um, middle-aged couple who are uh, falling for each other. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's been more tear-jerking for Peter and I than, than, than uh, dealing with the comedy elements. That's sort of left to the other characters in a way. Now, I don't know if it's the same in the in the UK, but in the States, it's kind of a rarity that uh, there are middle-aged rel relationships depicted on mm. screen and, and romances, for that matter. Were you surprised when you got the script? Uh, yes, I was surprised and delighted. Uh, I think the tide is turning a little bit. It's taking a while, but I think that... Um, uh, people who make television and films are beginning to see that Everyone wants to watch something that deals with them. We don't, you know, of course, there's the teen market, there's the young market, you have to cater for them. But, you know, women and men like to see, want to see things that they feel that they can relate to and that, you know, falling in love isn't, um, it isn't reserved for the under 40s or the under 30s. You know, anyone can fall in love and it can, can it surprise you at a time of your life when you were least expecting it. And, uh, you know, it kind of dispels the, the, the myth, especially amongst some youth, that, you know, if you're over 50, ugh, how could they kiss? How could they have a romance? You know, well, yes, you can, because it's all about love and feelings. And um, so if you show that, it, it kind of demystifies it a bit. And I think it's really great. And that's why, uh, partly why mum has been, certainly in England so far, so, so successful. Did mom feel like a departure for you at all as an actress? I mean, I I know the works that I know you in are you're playing fairly eccentric characters or steely reserved characters. Yes, I mean, uh, mom is very warm. It's very warm. Yes, yes. I mean, well, firstly, I hadn't really done something that came under the umbrella umbrella of comedy before. Um, 
And yes, I mean, she is, Kathy is so patient and kind and um, non-judgmental. Um, I mean, I, I would be pushed to be as, um, have all those uh, attributes that <laughs> she has all the time. But um, Same. I watch mom and I go, God, I wish I could be like that. I know. You kind of, she's so lovely and she, everybody, she tolerates everybody and doesn't tell them how it is, you know, that they're really being ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, it, it is in that way. It is quite an unusual diversion for me. But what I love about it is... Um, the writing is just so superb. It's very sharp. It's very sharp. It's very well observed. And um, I know you've had season one here and you're about to get season two. I honestly thought when I knew the Stefan, the writer, was going to do season two, I, I, a bit of me thought, oh, how is he going to, how is he going to better season one or equal it? And honestly, he has surpassed himself, I think. Because what he's done is, I mean, less so with Peter Mullen and I, because as you say, we're the steady centre. But with the, with the more peripheral characters, he watched what those brilliant actors did in series one. And he really took their creations, their characters, and moved them on and, you know, wrote them up and took them somewhere else. So s season two is... Uh, absolutely wonderful. That's what a good TV showrunner does, yeah. right? It takes what you've done the first season and doesn't just think, how do I want to tell a new story? It looks at what your actors did and how well they did it and yeah. translates that into challenges and successes for the second season. That's right. And he, he, he is such a compassionate writer and he understands people so well. And so he writes very tenderly and even the characters who are, you know, slightly ridiculous. I don't, I don't think he's ever patronizing them or um, uh, sending them up to a degree where you ridicule them. Um, yeah. So it, it's you know, he gets very, very, very close. And it's a very, I, I don't know if it's a, initially I think it was a British thing. You know, maybe Americans have kind of adopted it a little bit. But I've always, Mike Lee is the, really the best at doing that in a lot of his stuff. Of getting mm. very, very, very close to where some would even accuse him of mockery. But then sort of pulling the rug out from underneath everybody and giving you a fair amount of tragedy and, and drama just yes. at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think you have to tread that fine line. And if you... Uh, if you want people to take it seriously, you know, you can't, you, if you go into a territory, you go, oh, I know, well, I don't believe that, or I don't like the way they've treated that character, you, you, you lose people. I mean, the closer you can keep things to the truth through, a, through nevertheless, dramatic storytelling, then the better. Now, the, the, what was the first Mike Lee, was High Hopes the first Mike Lee film that you did? Um, it wasn't, but the oh, one before me. that, I, uh, it's the first movie I did for him. Um, I did a film for the BBC that he made um, when he was mostly doing films for the BBC and Channel 4 in England uh, called Grown Ups. But oh, yes, I've seen High Ups. Hopes is the first cinema film um, I made. What was it like taking part in that process as, a, as, a, as an actress at an early point in your career? And how did it affect doing the normal process for anything else that you did after? Well, it was defining for me. I mean, I met him when I was about 22. That's when we did Grown Ups. And um, it, it, I, I'd kind of, I'd been working since I was 16, but without much um, clarity about what I wanted to do. I, 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 I was doing some great jobs, but I, I aimlessly was wandering from job to job. Did you kind of fall into it, or was it something that you pursued at 16? I, well, I was going to be a singer, and I, um, and so I sort of pursued singing, but went to stage school, and then got more interested in, in acting. But my early jobs were, you know, I did some musicals, I did a bit of presenting, I did a bit of acting. So it was a real mishmash, and I didn't really have an idea about where where I was going, and that was fine. I was doing well, and I was making money and earning a living, and all of that, and having a nice time. But then I met Mike, and. Um, that whole thing of uh, playing somebody that wasn't like me, because up until that point, I'd really just played myself, mm -hmm. um, and that was fine. But um, I just enjoyed it so much, um, working with him and playing somebody so far away from me. Um, and I just loved the way he worked. I found it very liberating. I loved uh, not having a script as such that you start off with. I mean, you, you end up... Uh, knowing what you're going to say. You don't 
improvise on camera with Mike, but so you, it's, all, it's all pinned down and very clear once you shoot it. Um, but the process to get there is just more lengthy and much more of a collaboration. You start like six months before actually yes, shooting something yes. like that, right? I mean, right? You're, you're, you're part actor, part script writer, part, you know, it, it's a, and you do it with him. Um, so, but I just, I just loved it and I was good at it. Um, so, and yes, it has stayed with me inevitably because I've, I've worked with him so much over the three, four decades since then. And uh, so I'm very good at going into character and coming out of character. You know, I don't, I mean, people say to me now doing Long Day's Journey and Tonight, you know, how, like you just said, how, oh, you're going to go and do that play tonight. And I mean, yes, it is a taxing play and it's epic and it's a, it's very emotional and highly charged and it is hard work, but I can't spend my day preparing for that because I wouldn't have a life and I, I wouldn't be very well if I did that. I'm very good at leaving it behind and I know that that's part of the legacy of having worked with Mike so much. When you're in it, you're absolutely in it. But he always taught me to have my own antennae on the go because with him in particular afterwards you have to debrief and talk about hmm. what you've just done in an improvisation or and you have to discuss it so that discipline has has stayed with me and um i i mean i'm sure that's what keeps me sane because you know mary tyrone in long day's journey is is a hell of a character and if i took her home with me every night I, i'd be in an asylum you know so you just like, you know, the curtain curtains over, curtain comes down and you're done. Oh, done. Yeah, I'm done. Just click it off? Yeah. Maybe like a little bit of physical exhaustion or something from the actual work or yes. physical oh, work. Gosh. But yes, Physi physically tired and, you know, um, probably, uh, you know, still, cause it's quite a moving end. It's quite an emotional ending. So, yeah, you come off stage and I've got, you know, I'm, I've got the tears and everything and all of that. It's all happened. Um, but... Then I let it go. It's it's yeah. Now I you know I hate to I hate to kind of bring it up because you probably you just finished doing press for this movie like a, a little while ago, but that's a comp the opposite process from what we understand. I know what's coming. Exactly yeah. what Mr. Daniel Day Lewis does. Mm. Did you find that you were that it was completely opposite from him on set, or that it actually was somewhat similar? It's somewhat similar. In that we are both very good at absorbing ourselves in the character mm -hmm. but he chooses to remain in character when he's not shooting and I don't that's the difference um, but you know he he does his thing and I I did mine and there was I wouldn't interfere with his process and I wouldn't expect him to make comments on mine and it was a completely delightful experience um, and uh, you know, who am I to tell him how to work? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. The, the, but it, I, I, apart from anything else, apart from all of that, it, 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 you know, the results are staggeringly good. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> you know... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, it's what he needs to do. And listen, it's hard. Uh, acting's not straightforward. And if you, whatever you need to do, you need to do. And and as long as nobody gets in the way of that, which nobody did, and he doesn't get in the way of anything anyone else chooses to do, um, it's not a it's not a an, an issue. Mm -hmm. When you, you know, having worked with Mike Lee so many times, a director whose process other filmmakers know and you know <coughs> gossip about and talk about. Whenever you get on a new film set with a new director who knows of him, do they ask you about Mike Lee's process? Do they always try to be like, well, what is it, how does it actually work? What does they he do? They do a bit, because I think there's a lot of mystery surrounding it. I yeah. mean, one of the big mysteries is that I think people honestly think we just roll the camera and see what happens. Well, that's crazy. And we really, really don't, but... Uh, if you watch, actually watch those movies, you can tell there's far too much craft going on to think that these people that people are just making things up as yes, they go along. Yes, but I think people do, because they know, you know, this word improvisation crops up all the time, and I think they just feel that, yes, it's informed improvisation, but it's nevertheless improvisation, and it isn't. I mean, it's just that if you said to a scriptwriter, how long did it take you to write this script, and they said 18 months, you wouldn't 
think that was necessarily a long time. If they said four years, you think, well, that's quite a long time, but you know, maybe their gestation process is longer, whatever. With Mike, we're sort of doing that process together. Um, and so it may take you know, four, five or six months, but we're starting from with nothing. I mean, he has, oh yes. I mean, I, when I do a job with Mike, I have no idea, unless I know I'm going in to do, uh, like in Mr. Turner. Like a historical figure, yeah. Well, well, yeah, a historical figure, yes, of course, you could research. But what, what the point I was going to make was if, if I'm doing a cameo in something, because right. obviously I'm not going to be booked for six months <laughs> to do a cameo. He has to time it, because economically, and he wouldn't waste people's time hanging around and getting frustrated. But if, if you're going to be in it as a central character, you know, you're in it, for the whole duration, which is a long time. But yes, he has, he ha he's the one with the ideas, with the, with the overall theme or schemes or notions or feelings about the kind of film he wants to make or the kind of story he wants to tell. Like, for example, with Another Year, he wanted to make a film about loneliness mm. and, uh, and, and life by yourself and what it makes you do, how desperate it makes you, how alcoholic it can make you, a dependent, etc. But he doesn't share that with anybody. So I, d I went into another year, all I knew was I was booked for the whole time, so you know you're gonna be a central character, and that's it, that, you know nothing. And you show up on the first day, mm -hmm. and what is, the, what is the conversation? Well, I mean, after a sort of get together with everybody, because um, you might not see some people again, you right. might not you might not be in scenes with them. Um, the work is very um, private. It's one to one with him for quite some time, creating a character from scratch. Um, y you talk about people that you know or people that you know you may have seen somebody interesting on the street that morning who you don't know but you've got. E you, you take many months, and he's working individually with all of the actors, creating a character. And then he, he's the only person with a kind of umbrella view of the whole thing. So he's pulling all the pieces together. But then he, you know, he might say, okay, you create this person's backstory, and you might have created them uh, having a childhood sweetheart, and at that point he'll bring in the actor playing that, and then you carry on creating your joint histories, and then you might get married, and or, you know, all of that. So you create it all, and then you start improvising. And improvisations are long and boring because it's you're not the brief is not to be interesting. Right. You know, it's not. Jazz hands, let's entertain Mike. Be wacky. <laughs> it's, no, it's not. It's none of that. It, it's it's just to get the temperature and the the essence of what's going on with these characters. To so be like, what would this person do if we put them in this scenario, exactly. or what would this person do if we exactly. did this, and how does that inform the story? And of course, because by that time you know the characters very well, he can sort of put you in any situation, and you know how they're going to behave and it happens very organically. So then he can start to trust these um, scenarios that, that will inevitably emerge. By the time you get on set, uh, and also thank, I know you're here to promote mom. Thanks so much for <laughs> answering those questions. I've interviewed him and you're far more illuminating about his process than he, than oh. he allows himself to be. Well, he do, when people ask him about how he works, he does famously say, talk to Leslie. Does he really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does. <laughs> Um, but yeah, by the time you shoot, you've you've done master improvisations. Involving most of those scenes, or are even some of those scenes still kind of a surprise? Or maybe not some of them, because some of them are, are, are future stories, you know, the life carrying on in the future that you haven't looked at. But the point is you'll improvise them, and then he'll really hone it down and edit the dialogue and, you know, he'll, say, don't talk about that when you first come in, talk about that later, and, and you hone it down, and so it is absolutely set, but you don't ever write it down. The actors don't ever have it written down. You go over and over it and refine it um, so that it's in your head, and then you shoot it. 
And then the next day, you start to deal with the next scene. But um, so we know what we say, and every take is the same dialogue. So it's 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 I, what I'm trying to say in a very long and convoluted way is no, that, that we we don't have the script writing process, as it were. We we create this script collaboratively over that time. But by the end of it, even though it's taken four, five, six months, we have what Stefan does with mum, what yeah. Eugene O'Neill did, you have a script. Now, do you find that when you get into something with, with mum, you still want to create a fair amount of that backstory for yourself before you getting into shooting on the day? Or is it, yeah. now that I have this script that this great writer has given me, I can just sort of trust the script and operate off oh, of that? Oh, no, I do, trust, I do trust the script. But what you can do then is sort of, you can almost do the process in reverse. You can say, right, here's the script. Now let me work backwards and then just fill in the gaps that, that, I, that I need to. Um, and then it's just down to a bit of, you know, acting. After you <laughs> did uh, Grown Ups and High Hopes, was it hard to go and work with other people at that point? Or did you feel even more confident going into things as an actress? No, I knew that it was absolutely no point and it would be disrespectful to the other directors I was working think. with to say... Well, why don't you do it like Mike does it? You know, I need to like do this it. This one man does it. <laughs> this one man does it like this. I need to. No, I mean, no. Because, I mean, I, I mean, Mike is a genius director, but I've worked with some of the greatest, certainly in England, some of the greatest directors that we have. And I wouldn't. The, the bonus for me is that, you know, Richard Eyre, who's directed me now in Long Day's Journey and Tonight, who I also did Ibsen's Ghosts with, you know, we. We, we only worked together for the first time four years ago, but we're a, a great um, acting, a, actor-director duo. We, we, we really work well together. Um, and of course, if I said to him, oh, well, why don't you do it like Mike, or why don't you do it like some other, I would be losing out on... More work going forward. Or, or, well, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, you've got to be savvy. But I would be losing out on the experience of working with him and what he has to offer and what I can learn through him. And so, yeah, you, there's no point being blinkered like that. It would be negative. A great director seem to uh, love working with you, obviously because you deliver amazing performances. But I think even recently I saw an interview where Paul Thomas Anderson said that he can't wait to work with you again. <laughs> what do you think it is about, you know, how you interact with directors on set and how you go into a project that makes uh, these, these directors really excited to keep working with you? I mean, I guess it could just be the performances too, but... Well, I'm sure they also enjoy a fair amount of your process. Yes, I mean, I think at the end of the day, if I if if I didn't do what they deemed a good performance, however much they liked me, they probably wouldn't want to ask me back. <laughs> but um, I suppose by way of a bonus, you know, I I I um, I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson and I really really get on. I mean, there were I mean there were times in. Phantom Thread when we would do takes and he would have to, he would start laughing and he'd have to leave in the middle of a take and go in the room next door. And you could still hear him laughing. Um, we just, we get on. Um, I mean, I do the work. I'm not, I think it's truthful and fair for me to say about myself that I'm, I, 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 I turn up, I've done my homework, I, I've thought about it. I come on time. Um, I'm I'm open and receptive, and and then they let me do my thing. But I let them do their thing too, and and we have some laughs in between. So how whatever the pretty easy. It's, it seems quite straightforward to me, really. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions right here. Hi, um, so I have to ask with the upcoming weekend and because of your show is all about family and moms, uh, what are your Mother's Day plans? Is it Mother's Day this weekend? <laughs> yes. Is that a British thing too? That it's just... Yes, but I don't think it is in Britain. I think we had it in March. Oh, okay. So that's why I don't know that it's Mother's Day this weekend. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I Well, I won't probably be celebrating it because my son's in England. He bought me a present in March when it was Mother's Day. <laughs> I don't think he'll be um, uh, FedExing me any presents because he's found out it's Mother's Day here. But mum goes out on Mother's Day, doesn't it? Yes, well, there, there you go. It's perfect timing. Um, it's, I mean, there'll be... 
hopefully a lot of mothers watching mum and just feeling absolutely re relating to Kathy and the uh, trials and tribulations of her life and the people that she has to put up with and the dignity and warmth and love that she conducts her life with. Um, so that's very, very good timing. Yes, Mother's Day. I knew it was Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> you said uh, dignity and warmth. We were kind of talking about that earlier in the green room about in your performance, you kind of constantly have this face that you <laughs> know something. That the, characters are, the characters that are talking to you, you know something about them that they don't know about themselves. Yes. Yet you're not judging them for it. There's no. a lot that you're doing and just looks yes. with them. How, yes. did you, how did you kind of craft that? Is it simple? Like, well, I, I, I mean... You've got to be careful because you could end up go. You know, I don't know if you know the expression "mugging it." Whether that yeah, you could mug get, you, getting hammy. Yeah, yeah, you could go. And, you know, you pull all these weird faces to show what you're thinking. But uh, you know, the thing is, the audience are thinking it too. So you don't have to actually do very much because the audience watching are thinking. I can't believe he's just said that to his mother or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the audience are thinking that. So I just have to, li I just have to listen to them, really, and um, you know, th think it. It's it, it. I mean, in some ways, um, completely different characters, completely different women, and completely different worlds. But there's, it's sort of a bit like that. It was a bit like that in Phantom Thread. Mm -hmm. um, that 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 woman didn't say much and. She listened, but when she did speak, it was pretty direct and acerbic. But um, I don't want to hear it because it hurts my it ears. <laughs> hurts my ears. I mean, you'd never get Kathy saying that. Yeah. But but the similarities is that they both spend a lot of time listening and right. judging people. Um, just Quietly. That, it's just that Kathy doesn't really say anything, and when she does, it's loving and supportive, so that that person doesn't feel badly about themselves. She's too good to be true, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Hi. Um, so you've done a lot of theater also, and I was wondering if your process uh, in acting on theater on stage is the uh, same or different than uh, TV and film, and is it easier or harder to let go at the end of the day of the characters? I, I mean, I think that um, the, 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 the crux of, of the job, i.e. creating the character, is pretty much the same. But you know there are technical um, uh, technical things that are different between the two those well three medium really television film and theatre you know that I think that if if I didn't go on stage pretty frequently I'd I'd not like it because um, I I love the discipline of that I love the fact that nobody's going to um, edit me they can't make me look any better or worse, it's down to me and the cast. It's our responsibility, this arc of an evening with a beginning, middle and an end and um, you feel a great sense of responsibility and I think you can achieve um, a greater level of performance because it's fluid. Filming is a different challenge. It's You may have to peak and reach similar um, heights of emotion, but you've only got to achieve it that for that minute that you're, of script that you're dealing with, and you've got to then repeat it maybe 20 times within one morning. So the challenges are very different. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, sincerely, this isn't a trite comment, I'm sincerely grateful that I, I, I've got the opportunity now to do all, all, all different um, projects that take me on stage and film. They, they feed each other, I think, as well. Uh, one more, right here. Hi, um, I was just wondering, uh, what was the reaction like when, uh, when the first season came out for the show? And then, like, what, what was it like, you know, with the second season, like, was has it changed over time? Well, I think the, the 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 reception to season one was very was extremely positive, and I mean, not least of all because you've got a series that deals with two people in middle age falling in love and sort of, in some ways, behaving quite um, not in a ridiculous way, but they they they're behaving like two. 
25 year olds who, who fall in love and it sort of, the message is, you know, falling in love is falling in love. It affects you the same even if you're older. And I think that's a great thing to sort of demystify because everyone, a lot of young people seem to think, you know, love life stops once you're over 35. Um, so season one was very successful. Season two was because the writing has, is so good and the way it moves the story forward, particularly the will-they-won't-they they love story element of it, season two really pushes that forward with lots of little hiccups and uh, events and emotional crises along the way. Um, it seemed to hit uh, a spot with the British audience. that So it went through the roof, really, so it, it, extremely successful. And I, it's not a spoiler, but we are going to do the third and final series, which I'll shoot um, later this year. Why only three? Because I don't think anyone wants to milk it to death. That's the thing in the, in the in UK, you guys don't milk it to death. We No, because we're dignified. <laughs> We know when a good thing's come to an end. Um, no, I, that, I don't mean that. Um, it, 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 oh, it's because we're British. Um, no, well, I suppose, and, and I really don't know where series three will go. I haven't seen the scripts yet. They're being written. So I guess once they've either got together or not got together, you're done. Right. I mean, series one covers a year. Series two will cover a year, you know, the opening credits, you know, you see which month it is and you can, it goes, they both deal with a year. So this has been a slow burn romance. Um, so you couldn't, you, what are you gonna do, nine seasons and it goes over nine years and they still haven't kissed? I mean, you can't. Well, no, in the States they would get together and they would have a relate, you'd build the show Oh around. yes, and then they get divorced. And then and if yes, it was the state, yeah. she'd some she'd get pregnant again somehow. <laughs> like we just sort yes, of keep you, building, be a miraculous building things birth. In. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. It'll be a third and final series. It's dignified, and I get they it. They might, they might not, and I really don't know. So who? But that'll be it. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie, uh, Mum, uh, season two premieres this Sunday, right? Box, yeah. Brit on Britbox, um, Long Day's Journey into Night is currently running at BAM for a few more weeks. Oh, well, we only did the first show last night. Oh, wow. So we're on Congratulations till... on, on opening. Thank you. We d we're, um, we're, we're on till the end of May. I can't wait. I'm going to be there at the end of May. <laughs> and uh, is there anything else that people should look out for right now? Um, Harlots, season two, I suppose, at some point. I've just finished shooting that, which is on Hulu. Wow. Season one's been out already. Um, that's a set in a brothel in 1763. So that's a bit different. It's not very Cathy, is it? You're very busy. <laughs> uh, everybody, please give a big round of applause for Leslie Neville. Let's hear it. Thanks.